our destiny took a violent uh, crash when that decision was made not to transfer the power to east pakistan sheikh mujibur rahman was undoubtedly undisputed leader of pakistan one pakistan he was supposed to be the prime minister of pakistan like sheikh mujibur rahman uh, used to say when he came ever came to islamabad and looking at the road the new buildings he would always say i smell jute here so that was a very sarcastic remark but most of it was true i have no shame in saying that we are a very racist people we make difference between the the color for a pigment is white is black is brown when we go to look for a girl don't we look for a white girl so that's false sense of uh, superiority that complex devastated us i tell you with my hand on my heart i suffered the the trauma of that war for the rest of my life it's been how many years 50 years now and he suddenly faced him he had this mustache and he said sala fazavi abhi bhi mus raka hai which meant <laughs> you punjabi idiot you still putting on this mustache which is a sign of chivalry and you know and later on we laughed our guts out irony of uh, of the independence was that there was no doubt that uh, east pakistan was the first one to vote for the, the independence of a muslim state followed by the baloch uh khan of kalat they were very fond of pakistan because they were devout muslims they still are very devout muslims uh, but their treatment not by one person there's no one person there was a, 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 a a state of mind there was an attitude we had towards them i mean i have no shame in saying that we are a very racist people we make difference between the the color for a pigment is white is black is brown when we go to look for a girl don't we look for a white girl are we very nice to afghans who we looked down upon because they are here. so uh, even the minorities so that false sense of uh, superiority that complex devastated us in this form more importantly rest we see on a daily basis happening only the other day in sialkot uh, the sri lankan was killed for whatever reasons but it is it is moved and motivated and pushed by our a uh, uh, state of mind which is to look down upon somebody who's not equal to you may may it be religiously may it be uh, geographically may it be race wise so that led to that there was no one person responsible it was that state of mind from the west pakistanis that trickled down and it as if you know the truck load came onto our heads what happened in east pakistan was more political which was uh, assisted and fueled and ignited by the enemy which is india of course there is no qualm about that the political situation in east pakistan at the time when i found it being there and learned it over a period of uh, time and that bangladesh mind you was a majority East Pakistan was a majority so the minority was ruling the country and that grievance grew over a long period of time amongst the uh, intellectual elite of uh, bengalis who were not wrong there was very little participation of uh, bengalis in, in 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 the state affairs although 
uh, I would say the major work done by any government was that of uh, Ayub Khan's time. Ayub Khan was the one who did numerous, uh, who took numerous steps to keep uh, the two wings unified, which is to say, like if somebody was to get married uh, from one province to another, there were two, only two provinces, remember, West Pakistan and East Pakistan. And uh, so the government would give them subsidy. They would get money from the government to encourage people, you know, intermarriages uh, between the two provinces. Secondly, the flight fares were subsidized by government. I mean, in those days, you could travel for a very little amount, uh, whether to return ticket to Dhaka. So all those steps were being taken and more induction into the government um, bureaucracy uh, of Bengalis. So government made efforts. Now, well, everything followed immediately Ayub Khan because Ayub Khan to Yahya Khan and Yahya Khan to Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and war. What I found was that there was a, a successful feeling of uh, that grievance transcending uh, down to uh, uh, the lower man, which was that we are being exploited by uh, West Pakistani. I'll tell you that they, uh, there was a common feeling of calling us as Punjabis rather than Pakistan army. So they all looked at us as Punjabi army. And we found it funny and uh, uh, were amazed because we were not 100% Punjabi army. But that feeling was there. So they had successfully transcended that. Like Sheikh Mujibur Rahman uh, used to say when he came ever came to Islamabad, and looking at the road, the new buildings, he would always say, I smell jute here. So that was a very sarcastic remark. But most of it was true. Because seeing the land of East Pakistan, seeing the development, the level of development and, and, and the level of uh, the welfare of those people, having come from West Pakistan, it wasn't amazing that they felt very uh, odd and demeaned and different. It was just that an incident of uh, elections took place. You know, when uh, uh, Yahya Khan took over, the very first thing he did was to ask uh, for the intelligence uh, to inform him if he were to hold, uh, if he was to hold uh, free and fair elections in Pakistan, what would be the outcome? And to his uh, surprise, he learned that uh, it will be dominated by Bengalis, which is quite natural and it's an obvious result because they were in majority. Political parties in East Pakistan at that time were fragmented. There was no one single uh, party that was in power. There was Jamaat Islami, there was uh, Bashani group, and there were so many socialists and religious and uh, democratic, uh, the, 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 the right wing forces, which were in the form of various political parties. What happened was that when uh, Yahya Khan removed Abdo, you know, Abdo was. Uh, an ordinance which banned political activities in Pakistan. And that was because Ayub Khan had introduced a new um, pattern of democracy, which was called basic democracy. He had his own way of doing democracy, the so-called democracy. So that abdo was removed by Yahya, uh, Yahya Khan, and which meant that everybody was free to do politics. And he recreated these four provinces, five provinces, East Pakistan and four provinces here, and allowed election, electioneering. Just before the elections, I mean, I was part of the election teams in Sakhar in 1970. We held the elections there. They were absolutely free. There was no interference because there was martial law and elections were being held. Uh, one big event took place after the elections, which was 
that a terrific uh, cyclone uh, happened in East Pakistan, which killed millions of people. Now, in the aftermath of that cyclone, uh, Mujibur Rahman and his party, Awami League, they worked very hard to restore order and bring people, uh, displaced people back to their homes and, you know, and water subsided and all that stuff. In that exercise, Awami League gained huge popularity. And literally, with that cyclone, rest of the political parties got washed out. And Awami League uh, became the sole hmm, uh, voice of East Pakistan. Now, when we went there, so there was either People's Party or Awami League leading the elections. Uh, obviously, Awami League was the winner. Then, a lot of conspiracies took place in various forms and shades where it was decided by those who mattered at that time not to give power to the Bengalis. Our destiny took a violent uh, crash when that decision was made not to transfer power to East Pakistan. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was undoubtedly undisputed leader of Pakistan, one Pakistan. He was supposed to be the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Yes, on every step, every minute. I mean, they looked at us as oppressors. And uh, well, us means we were army. With, with us, the pattern of uh, uh, superiority is not there because army works on an uh, equal basis. We don't distinguish between Pathan and Balochi and who we, while we are there. Sindhi... And uh, our camaraderie, our pattern of living of the army is so different because they all live like a family uh, on a regular basis. That is the, the, the essence of the army because they f live and die together. So we didn't have that feeling towards them, but they hated us not as uh, army, but they hated us as Punjabis. And as I explained earlier, Punjabi word became uh, uh, a symbol of oppression as far as they were concerned. So they looked uh, uh, upon us also like, and then you see, when uh, action took place, we immediately put a different hat. We picked up the guns against the enemy. Enemy was not those people, but the infiltrators and the black sheep um, amongst them who were Indians, you know, there are a lot of books written about it. I'm not saying something new, but I know it because I was there. I mean, we used to sleep in our bunkers in uniform with our boots on and our AK-47 on our bedside. I never slept without a weapon loaded on my uh, side within my own uh, army uh, environments in the defense uh, regions where I was. So the, People looked upon us either for mercy or with contempt. There was no camaraderie because that feeling we had not left amongst them. When the political uh, situation developed in which after the 70 elections, Power was not being transferred by the army to the elected people, and it dragged on. Various issues took birth. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and his party came up with six points uh, uh, agenda, very famous in history, where he said, "On these terms, we will uh, work with West Pakistan, which is to say, if you give us defence, foreign trade, currency." Etc. Et so there are six points which were rather controversial, not acceptable by. So that led to tension between East and West politically, and it was translated into social attitudes between the two uh, uh, nations. 
and it came to a crunch where uh, army had to stop this uh, violence in Dhaka and the background was that the Indians soon after the election found Awami League as an ally and they wanted to reinforce them. They bought certain leaders and moved Sheikh Mujibur Rahman from a democratic leader to a, to a rebel. An army had to stop that from happening uh, because it was uh, East Pakistan was the responsibility. First of all, uh, the army, Pakistan army, is not trained to be oppressive. The oppression comes from uh, from uh, some sort of revolutionary forces who take over power and have very strong uh, elements amongst them who can either uh, do oppression or you know command entirely from a different pedestal. This was a regular, trained, highly uh, trained army, Pakistan army, which it remains. And there was no, uh, I never in my own army career, never learned how to oppress people. My job was purely professional, which is enemy and fighting with an enemy in a uh, geographical, territorial uh, situation with the weaponry we have and then learning about that. East Pakistan was, as, as I explained over and over again, was an entirely different situation in that army was only tasked with uh, stopping the Indians infiltrating uh, our part of the state and getting rid of them. And that was the task which, as I said, we landed in Dhaka but sprang towards the borders to clear the land from the infiltrators and from the Indians. And they did actually uh, go away and uh, we had taken full control uh, of the country. In the process what was happening, uh, like for instance, I'll give you an example. I was asked to uh, move on and advance and join my advance forces near the border. Now in the interim, on the way, any resistance what was to be met with resistance. That's how army was trained. And the lay of the land and the geography of East Pakistan is such that in most parts there is there are uh, rice paddy fields and paddy fields are inundated with water. And that's how rice goes with more water. And the raised grounds would always have huts and a kind of a small hamlet which are known as Bari. So Bari was like Abadi, a small uh, habitation. And the, the, the miscreants or the enemy with the miscreants would hide in those houses as civilians and put their machine guns on all sides. and prevent our advance. Now, all intelligence assisting us, everything was there. So they were using human uh, uh, population, children, women, older, in the front as a shield. Now, rape is a very terrific and uh, unimaginably uh, uh, discomforting thought. I can tell you as uh, an ex-army officer, then commanding uh, uh, troop, my own troops, there is no way that within that regulated setup of then Pakistan army or even today's Pakistan army, that any member any soldier of mine who is under my command will sneak out of my command and go out and commit illegal activity of any form without my knowledge, without any retribution, without any uh, disciplinary action. Now, I can tell you that we were fighting 
in an area where we were surrounded by enemy there was not even a fanciful thought in the mind of any soldier to go out and carry out rape and come back safe entering into somebody's house who may well be an enemy will lynch you there is there was no such situation that there were women roaming around all over and you one could get hold of anybody and do whatever they wanted to do there was no such thing it was war i mean the history and story of vietnam rapes and american troops carrying out excesses in iraq and al gharib prison there was no such thing in east pakistan absolutely not they were not trained to to do anything of the kind and they were trained to fight and be secure and secure land and and and, and do their duty in certain cities there were rapes there must have been rapes i i know of no single incident i tell you with my hand on my heart i have not heard any of my friends or any of my soldiers ever narrating a story of a rape to me i've heard of killing i've heard of uh, uh, wounding people i've heard of burning houses whatever for uh, their movement at once but uh, i could give hundreds of examples and go on and on and on yes you're 100% right what happened was i'll give you the background that in 1971 uh, march when the crackdown took place 25th 26 march before that some funny advisor of janan yaya khan told him to remove foreign journalists from uh, dhaka they were ordered by the because there was martial law martial law authorities in dhaka to leave pakistan and when you tell a foreign journalist i've lived with them for 40 years in england and i know how they oh they were jumping they were so happy they knew that the news is taking going to take birth here so what they did was they didn't go anywhere they just crossed the border and sat all around uh, the border on indian side and kept receiving information from their sources uh, who were indian uh, going in and out of east pakistan all their stories and they were coming uh, in lot of uh, fanciful details of this happened and that happened and so many bodies now the the difference in in the face and appearance of uh, Beng- indian bengalis and west pakistan bengalis were none they all looked alike and those soldiers there's a book by an indian brigadier who was in charge of their commandos who wrote a book and said i trained the mukti bani i created the mukti bani mukti bani means liberation army and we gave them the same dress and everything it's an eye opener but i i don't want to go behind any uh, explanations and any uh Uh, justifications i am a witness of a horror i was part of that horror i was part of that those excesses that happened not in minor details but excesses to a nation excesses to people whether intentionally or through war or through the the after effects of a war that was so shocking and sad that i cannot imagine any other uh, war theater where so much of uh, torment and devastation took place either physically or not really there wasn't uh, it was a uh, um, land with less uh, what you call uh, developed construction and buildings and uh, skyscrapers but there was devastation in uh, as a whole uh, philosophically in their psyche in our psyche i suffered the the trauma of that war for the rest of my life 
It's been how many years? 50 years now. 